We are so glad to have you with us and looking forward to a great day together. And uh, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn over to Isaiah 35. I want to read this passage of Scripture. It was one that Stacy and I read earlier this week together, and it just was extremely profound and uh, very encouraging as well. For those that are going to be joining us later on and watching the video as opposed to the live stream, we want to welcome you also to our service today. And uh, we are looking forward to time together in the Word of God and uh, time together in praying and uh, just looking and reflecting a few moments on what God has done and uh, looking forward to what He is going to do as well. In Isaiah 35, we're going to read all 10 verses here. It's actually part of Advent reading and part of the, the telling of Christ's coming, but I love the words that are here. So let's follow along. Psalm, or Isaiah 35, verse 1, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and, and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. And the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee. Away. Isn't it a great promise and great truths that are found in that particular passage? And we definitely rejoice, especially as we look forward to the Christmas season and we get to celebrate the birth of Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer. Well, let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. And again, welcome to our service today. God, I thank you so much for your grace. And thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ that was even foretold by Isaiah while the people of Israel were going into captivity and And knowing that they're going to pay for their sins, there's also hope and that there is um, a Redeemer who is coming that will restore them in relationship with Him, and He will come in victory. And God, we live in that same victory today. We live already knowing that Christ has come, and we look forward to the fulfillment of this promise in the days ahead. We rejoice in You. We thank You for Your faithfulness. We thank You that You are a sovereign God, one who rules over all things. And there is nothing that is outside of Your control and nothing that is beyond your ability to bring about your good and your glory in the midst of the circumstances that we face. And God, as we come this day, we come with a desire to open the Word of God and to declare who you are, declare what you are doing, to be encouraged, to be challenged in our own hearts this day. I pray that your name would truly be lifted up, that you be glorified in all that is done this day. And we give you thanks. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let me give you a couple of announcements just about some things that are coming up. First of all, coming up on 11-22, November the 22nd, uh, is our uh, Thanksgiving service, and uh, we're going to give you opportunity to participate that day as well, and uh, we'll make sure everything is socially distanced and cleansed and all that kind of stuff, but we want to hear from you. Some of the things I think you can be thinking about, what has God been teaching you during this time of COVID? What have you been learning, learning about yourself, learning about God and His faithfulness? Uh, But we also have many other things to be thankful for. You know, it's interesting that what dominates our thinking is typically COVID-19, right? But is God only working in COVID-19 right now? Well, obviously not. He is working in so many ways and so many different ways that we can give thanks to Him. And so sometimes, as we were using a couple weeks ago about reframing, reframing outside of COVID-19, and let's put it in a frame of what God is doing and how God is faithful and how God is at work. So that's coming up uh, on that Sunday, right before Thanksgiving. We look forward to that Sunday and participating with that as well. Also, tomorrow night, there is going to be a prayer meeting by Zoom at 7 o'clock. There's a link in the email that went out this morning at 9 o'clock from the church office, and uh, you can tap into that link. Join us. Uh, Several of you have joined us over the different times that we've done this, but many of you have not. Let me encourage you to join with us, and uh, we don't make you do anything weird. We don't make you do anything you don't want to do. 
Uh, you can just come and participate by being present. Uh, we don't force you to pray out loud for everybody to hear or anything like that. And, uh, but uh, you can pray, and it is a great opportunity. I always leave that time very encouraged, and uh, so I want to encourage you to join us tomorrow night at 7 p.m., and uh, you can join with us and spend a little bit of time praying, and I think really a good opportunity for us to be praying for us as a church for a time of spiritual growth, especially since we've been in Ephesians 2 and verse uh, 15 as well. Yeah. That is a Zoom link. That's correct. Yeah, Zoom link. Thanks for making that clear, Armando. Okay, and then also I just want to mention our missionary of the week. And before I do that, please be in prayer for Mary Brewer. She's been dealing with some health issues. Um, I think actually is in the hospital still, Nathan. Okay, she's home now, but we do want to be praying for her. Uh, she's been having some fainting going on. Not sure exactly what's going on. Uh, but do keep uh, Norman and Mary in prayer there in Albania. And I know that they would greatly appreciate that. And uh, maybe even just drop them a note, tell them that you're praying for them. But our missionary of the week this week is actually Bill and Ellie Hansen working in the country of France. And of course, you've been watching the news. You know that France has basically gone back into a kind of a shutdown mode. And that has obviously had an impact on them and their ministries. They are still doing Zoom services uh, for their uh, French-speaking services. They are starting actually today. They're starting an English service. Um, and they will do that in person because they have only a few people coming to that. But uh, do continue to pray for the Hansons uh, as they work there. In, um, in France, and I know they would appreciate prayers this week uh, for them as well. Well, once again, we are so glad to have you here. Uh, Jenny is going to uh, play a special just before we get into our message this morning, and uh, so uh, don't sing, but sing in your heart. You can do that if you want to. She's going to be playing the song she's going to be playing is When We All Get to Heaven, and I look forward to that more and more every day, and uh, definitely look forward to his return and being able to spend eternity in heaven, present with him. Thank you very much. Isn't it good to hear music? And I uh, look forward to days ahead when we're able to sing together as well, at least sing verbally together as well. All right, let's take our Bibles. We're going over to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 15. And then you can also take your Bibles and go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time this morning. This is our last uh, message looking at this particular phrase, speaking the truth in love. We've been looking at Ephesians 4.15 
for several weeks now. And uh, we're not done with the verse, we're just done with this phrase. We're going to pick up the rest of the verse uh, next week, but uh, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way uh, into him who is the head, into Christ. This is the focus. Remember, all this in, in light of the entire chapter, entire book about Christ, what he is doing, the church, and really the mandate and the instruction to us as the church. And this particular context is in the light of uh, edifying and ministering to one another in the body of Christ. That is us together as the church. And we had a number of people this morning that were out ministering to you as the church, and we're thankful for that, and uh, we're thankful for their service to us. And hopefully through music, you've been edified and encouraged uh, as well. And these are ways that we practically do this. Yesterday morning, we had food pantry, and wow, we had almost as many volunteers yesterday as we did actually clients come in. There was a ton of volunteers. The Lord has given us more contacts in our community as we have probably 15 or 18 volunteers now coming from our community. And uh, this is a great opportunity just to connect with them and build relationships with them. And uh, it is really good. I'm thankful. Plus, many of you have been coming out, and I'm thankful for that as well. But that is a way that we are ministering. So that's putting into practice what we've been talking about. And I want to commend you on that and encourage you on that uh, once again. But let's remember, last week we talked a little bit about this idea of love as we're getting to the second half of that phrase. And remember this, that last week we were talking about that love originates from God. The only reason that you and I could ever love another person is because of God's love for us. That always begins there. And uh, this is important for us to recognize. But second, we also recognized this last week, we talked about this just by way of introduction, is that love for others flows directly from our love towards God. So in other words, our vertical relationship is reflected in the horizontal relationship. And this is always important for us to keep in mind because if we have horizontal issues, it's because there's a vertical issue. You cannot say, biblically, this is not just my opinion, you cannot say, I am right with God and who cares about my horizontal relationships? It doesn't matter. No, it absolutely does. This is what goes back to our statement, our mission statement as a church that we love God, we love others, and we make disciples. So these things actually tie together. We love God and we love others are not really two separate ideas. They're actually... They're actually a continuation. My love for God is continued in my love for others. So I cannot negate that and say, well, I've got that part down about loving God, but as far as loving others, uh, I'm not going to focus on that right now. Well, it actually all works together. And this is what we're going to see a little bit more about today as well. Last week, we finished up the message by looking at ways that we misconstrue what love is. In other words, we, we kind of pick up worldly thinking as far as what love actually looks like and what it sounds like and and how it behaves. And so today we want to take some time and specifically look at how does love biblically behave? How does it look? And how do, how do we in our relationships? And, and here's the temptation, because 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a very familiar passage to us. And uh, amazingly enough, we don't have a wedding going on, and we're actually looking at 1 Corinthians 13, because that's typically when it is, it is spoken about. But do you know that the context of 1 Corinthians 13 is actually not a wedding all right, I know that's shocking probably to some of us, but it is, it is not the wedding, but it's actually the church. And, and we just saw before, he's talking about this, this gifts that are given to the body so that the body can minister to one another. Same language that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 4. And so he's using this language and he says, now, what is most important is this idea of love. And this is what we're going to get into today. Think about this, that love, and this is very profound, that love uh, if, it is not, uh, if it is not exhibited, if it's not demonstrated in the church, then we could have the greatest programs, we could have the greatest ministries, we could have the greatest outreaches, we could have the greatest messages, which you do already, you could have the greatest messages going on, but if you're absent or missing love, then he says all of it is just like an empty, worthless sound. That ought to strike within us, maybe not Fear, but at least a great pause to say, oh, is love present? Is love present? So we'll get into this more in a few moments as we look at this. So our primary focus today is really about how we love one another. I, I was thinking about this. If you could imagine, all right, imagine, and because of COVID, I don't want you to look around because I want you breathing on other people, but thinking in your mind, there are other people sitting around you. Who is someone that you don't get along with? Don't point to them. Don't say their name. 
Who is someone you don't get along with? Who is someone that you struggle with? Who is someone that as you came in the door today and you realize that you don't get to pick your seating, that you're hoping you don't get seated by them? Are you ever like that on the plane? You know, when people are coming in and you have a sign seat. I like flying southwest. And Stacy and I have this little program worked out so that no one will sit by us. We just start acting weird and strange. You don't shower three days in advance. No one will sit by you. But if you're sitting there and you have a signed seat, and especially if you're like on a cross the seas flight, like 13 hours going into Taipei or something, and, and you're watching people come in and you're like, I hope they don't sit by me. I hope they don't sit by me. I hope, oh, that wouldn't be okay to sit by me. And mostly it's because of size, right? Because I want as much space in my seat as I possibly can. Now, some of you came into church, and that's how you came into church. Don't sit me there. Don't sit me there. Don't put me there. If I give you a 20, Becky, will you sit me where I want to sit? Um, you know, none of those things going on. But we think about this. How do you get along with other people in the church? Are there people that you avoid, people that you'd rather not be with, people that you um, really don't like, people that have irritated you, people that drive you nuts, uh, whatever else? You... Think about those people today. Don't think about the, the nice, cute little babies that you fall in love with. I'm like, oh, yeah, I love the babies. They're all fine. And we're not talking about that. We're talking about those that are the most difficult. I love what Paul David Tripp, let me read you this quote by him. Um, I've been reading a lot of his books again recently. But he says this. He says, we need to guard against seeing people as obstacles of our ministry. Do you ever see that? Uh, sometimes, like at food pantry, that's difficult. You see people that can be rude and unkind. And you're like, wow, it'd just be better off if they never came again. But then I have to recognize, no, that's who I'm called to serve. Those are the people I'm called to minister to. But it's actually true within the body of Christ as well. And that's what we're primarily talking about. We're not necessarily looking outward today. We're looking inward and saying, how do we get along with each other? Are the people that that's the kind of attitude? You know, our church would be so much better off if that person wasn't here. Maybe I would drop a line to them with some suggestions of other churches that they could attend. I hope that you would never do something like that. I hope you'd never think something like that. But we have to recognize that people are actually the purpose of our ministry. And he goes on to say this, people are the ministry. And we love these messy people. You know why? Because we also are messy people. There's no one here who has it all together. Not a single person who has it all together. We are all messed up people. We are all in need of a Savior, and this is why Christ came. This is why he demonstrated his love to us. And so we keep this in mind, that we are a people that are desperately in need of a Savior, and we live with people who are in desperately need, desperate need of a Savior as well. We all need the gospel message every single day of our life. Every time we come to church and we gather together, we need the gospel message. And every time that we are seeing each other throughout the week and we're on Zoom with life groups, we need to be sharing the gospel. We need to hear it and we need to be speaking it. This is the idea of what we're talking about with God's love. And so true biblical godly love, what does this look like in our relationships? You can think about the worst relationship and the questions that we're going to look at today. You need to find out what is your answer to those. And I hope that you will leave here convicted and that you will leave here challenged. And at the end, this is part of the challenge is that if there is conviction, that you will confess it as sin. It's wrong. If we are not loving the way that God has called us to love, we are sinning. There's no other way about it. It's not like just a slight defect and a slight thing I need to improve. It's sin. Let's call it what it is. We can confess it, and then we need to repent. And then we may need to seek forgiveness from one another. We may need to go and seek someone out and say, I need to ask your forgiveness. And then we need to start talking about reconciliation and restoration within the body of Christ. See, this is where John 13, 35 becomes extremely significant because the whole world will know that we are the followers of Christ by our love one for another. And that's because this love that God is talking about is a very powerful thing. It's very strong. It's very different than the world that we see around us. Well, as we think about this idea of love, speaking the truth in love, what kind of love is this? Well, it's what we would define as agape love. And again, very familiar to us, and sometimes the familiarity causes us to miss out on the impact of what we're talking about, but it is a God-like expressed love that we are to share with one another. Now, let's say at the outset, this is impossible. In fact, on your own, on my own, we can never do this. This is why I often will say this, is that the one thing that will reveal where we walk with, where we are in our walk with the Lord is our relationships one with another, is because it is hard to love people, and you cannot do it in your own strength. You must only, and you can only do it as you are resting in Christ. And as Christ is living his life through you. There are a couple of things that I want to point out that talk about this godly love, this agape love, this godlike love that we're talking about. 
And it's, first of all, this. It is Christ-like, it is Christ-empowered, and it is Christ-enabled. So that's all kind of one statement there. Christ-like, Christ-empowered, and Christ-enabled. There is no way that you and I can love like 1 Corinthians chapter 13 teaches us to love in our own strength and our own ability. Don't even give it a try because it is doomed to failure from the beginning. This is what Christ does in this. This is part of the transforming work of Christ in our own lives. But there are three things that we want to go to the definition. First of all, we see this. Agape love is unconditional. Unconditional. Let me just see if I can reframe this for you and help you understand this. That is that there is no condition that can be offered to cause it to cease or to be withheld. There is no condition that can cause it to be withheld or cause it to cease. That means bad breath. That means chewing with your mouth open. That means looking odd and not dressing like everybody else. That means royally messing up with your attitude. That means royally messing up relationships. That means failing to follow through on your word, keeping promises. That means, and you can add to that list on and on, there is no condition where it will be withheld or where it will cease. It is unconditional. And this is the same kind of love that you and I receive. This is why we say it originates with God. And what we receive from God, think about how many times you failed God in the past year. Think about how many times you failed God in the past month. How about the past week? How about the past day? How about the past hour? And has God withheld his love from you in any way whatsoever? Well, the answer to that is obviously no. Now, when we talk about this idea of love, it doesn't mean that there, there's just kind of like an overlooking of sin and we pretend no one is sin, we pretend we're all perfect. No, that's actually the power of this love is that we actually see the sin for exactly what it is and yet we still love. We still continue to demonstrate that love. God isn't blind to our sin. He knows it's there, but he also knows it's been covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He also recognizes that he continues to love us in the midst of that sin no matter what doesn't mean there aren't consequences to our sin. doesn't mean that there aren't ramifications to that, and we understand that. So please understand today, we're not talking about ramifications of sin and the consequence of sin, but we're talking about is our action when people do sin, and how do we respond? Do we continue to love? Not only is it unconditional, but it's undeserved. In other words, we could say it this way, there is no action needed to en en enact its bestowment on the recipient, and there is no action that can negate it. There is nothing. There's no time, no place, nothing that can be done to deserve even a little bit more. Do you know, think about this with God, that there is nothing that you can do this morning that will impress God and cause him to love you even the slightest bit more. He loves us fully. There is no more and there's no less. It is fully loving us. And this is the same kind of love we're to have towards one another that we are fully loving each other as well. It is undeserved. And then we also see this, it is unending. There is no time or situation where it will ever cease. Kind of ties it all together there, but it is unconditional, undeserved, unending. So what are the characteristics of, these, of this idea of love? Let's go over to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm going to take the time to read down through just the beginning of verse 8. So verse 1 through verse 8 at the beginning there. So verse 13, he says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Again, think about how profound what Paul is saying there, the, the dramatic things that he says even to the point of becoming a martyr, but if I do it without love, it's all worthless. It's all worthless. As a church, whatever we do, if we do it without love, it's empty, vain, worthless. He goes on in verse 4, love is patient. This is where we get into the descriptions. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Now, all this, remember, what, what we're framing it in, what we're putting it back to, speaking the truth in love. So we're all looking, speaking the truth, and we're doing this in love. So what does love look like when we're speaking the truth? That's what we're getting to. That's the point that we want to make 
as we get into the passage. So don't lose that along the way. And again, so many times we read over this really quickly and we're like, oh, I'm good. I'm pretty good. But hopefully we'll be able to dig into it a little bit deeper and you'll be able to say, oh, I'm not good. And I hope that because I know that all of us fall short. And if we're not seeing ourselves as falling short, then we're really not being honest. We're not allowing God to work in our hearts. So I'm asking that God would do that through us today as well. So as we think about this relationship that we have with God and who loves us with all of our baggage, I love what one of a, a pastor I heard say many, many years ago, you know, we all come to church with baggage. And we all come, and he would describe it as, as a U-Haul. We all come with a U-Haul. It's full of our baggage, all of our stuff. And he said, yeah, sometimes there are people that come with not only a U-Haul, but they have several U-Hauls that they're bringing in. So it's not really talking about the amount of baggage that we're bringing in. It's the reality that we all have it. And it's the reality that God continues to love us. And it is this same kind of love. There's no one that we can put a limitation on. There's no one that should walk in our door and be like, oh boy, I can't believe they're here. Yesterday we had a guy show up at the end of food pantry and uh, he was asking about food. And I said, okay, well, this is what you have to do. You need to do this and you do that. And he's like, well, that's a lot of red tape. There should just be food here for everybody. And then he kind of walks off saying a bunch of other things. And I found myself trying to rise to this argument. And then I'm thinking, wait a second, I don't need to argue over this. Uh, I just said, hey, you know, you can contact the food bank and talk to them. They've got unlimited supplies of food. Talk to them. And, uh, but I'm thinking as he walked away, it was almost like whew, he left. But you know what? That's not actually how we should respond. What we ought to be responding is like, how can I show Christ's love to this man? But again, we want to bring it back into the church. Are there people that you look around like, well, I'm so glad they are not here today. Well, that's the person you need to be loving in the same way that God loves us. Or do you like, oh boy, roll their eyes at that person again. I can't believe they did that again. And you know what? Sometimes people do funny things. And it's, I guess, in one sense, okay to laugh a little bit at that, at that as long as our love is not being withheld because of those things. All of us are quirky. Did you ever find that out when you were first married? Now, I'm not going to embarrass Stacy and talk about all the quirky things she did. Um, but it was definitely like, oh, you do that. Okay. <laughs> Um, I will have to continue to love you. I think I had few adjustments. She had a lot more adjustments than I ever did uh, and probably still is finding things out. And uh, how many of your husbands snore? Okay, yep, and a few other people are not being honest um, as well. But uh, did you ever dream, like, I can't wait to marry this guy so I can listen to him snore in the middle of the night? No, we didn't think about it. But do you still love him? Sure you do. You better, anyways, um, even if you're trying to hold his nose and uh, keep him from snoring. But uh, you should still love him in that way. You know, this is how God continues to love us. And we want to show the same love. So let's take a few moments here and look at what it has to say here. And I think we probably need to pause for a second here. So let's look here at what Paul is saying to us in these number of things here. I think we have 13 points that we have. Back in college, the founder of our university, uh, Maranatha, uh, he was known for his messages. He would get up in chapel and he's like, I've got 17 points in my message today. And you're just like, oh boy, this is really long. But he was pretty fast through those 17. I have 13 points in the message today. We're going to be pretty fast. Stay with me as we get through this uh, as well. But number one, how do we deal with others' limitations and their repeated failures? Do you ever people ever disappoint you? Do people ever fail you? Ever not follow through on promises that they actually make? And the truth is, we sometimes have that experience, and then how do we respond to them? Is, it, is your response something like this, like, well, I've learned my lesson. I will never trust them again. Okay, well, what if God treated us that way? How many times has God given us an opportunity, and we have failed in that? Imagine if he would say, okay, if that happens, I will never, ever, ever, ever trust you again. Where would Adam and Eve be? Yes, there was consequence of their sin, but you know what God entrusted them with? That they would be the ones through whom he would redeem all mankind. Wow, talk about incredible trust. And he continued to work through them. He continued to show his love. How do we handle multiple and repeated mistakes? And it's the same mistake. It goes back to Peter's question, like, God, how many times do I have to forgive him? I forgave him seven times. Isn't that pretty awesome? And he's like, no, 70 times seven. And it's not even that God is putting a limit on there. He's just saying, look, there's no limit to it. There's not a line that we draw in the sand. Do we threaten and withhold love? Do we draw a line in the sand and say, okay, if you cross this line one more time, then here is what I'm going to do. Again, remember, we're not talking about consequences to sin. 
but we're talking about how I respond in love toward these people. Because we know that First, or in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, if a brother be overtaken a fault, ye which are spiritual, look to restore him, and you bear one another's burdens. What is that burden? It's directly linked to the sin and the consequence of that sin. And we continue to love them, especially when they're responding and they're seeking uh, restoration and reconciliation and they're owning their sin. We want to make sure. So this is what we find about love here in, verse, in this first part is love is patient. It is long-suffering. Love is patient. It is long-suffering. I will love through failures. I will love through struggles and disappointments and, and discouragements. I will continue to love others within the body of Christ. This is what it means to speak the truth in love. We will be patient. We won't say, you know, I've already told you this 24 times, which means you should have heard it six times, which means you should have got it by now. No, that's not what we're saying to them. What we're saying to them is I'm going to continue to love you and I'm going to continue to speak truth. And I'm going to continue to extend love to you, the same love that God extends to me. All right, the second one, let's move on here. He says, what have you done for others? This is kind of a question. How do you serve other people? When you think about this, are you serving and ministering to others within the body of Christ? Do you know that Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 and 14 talks about this idea of service, that we have been set free, not so that we can serve ourselves, but so that we can serve others. And he ties directly in that particular passage how this service towards others is actually a demonstration of love, which is the fulfillment of the commands, the, ten, the great commands. This is the fulfillment. It is our love one to another. And how do we do this? We do this by serving each other. So when Paul talks about the idea of edifying and serving or ministering one another in the church, he's not just kind of talking out of the side of his head like something he made up. This is actually what reality is when it comes to understanding what God's love for God and love for others actually is. How do you prove useful to others in the body of Christ? And remember, we're thinking about that person that kind of drives us nuts that we'd rather avoid, and he's calling us to be useful towards them, to be profitable towards them, to be beneficial towards them. Do you act for their good, or do you refuse to act towards them on their behalf and serve them because you view them as being unworthy? They don't meet your standard that you have set up. We look for ways to minister, rather, is what we ought to be doing. We ought to be looking for ways to edify, to encourage, to build up, looking for ways that we can go out of our way to help them, to encourage them. Not because there's any benefit to me, but because this is what true love actually is. So this is what we write in that statement, love is kind. Love is kind. The idea of kindness is the idea of usefulness, beneficial, profitable. So are we beneficial and useful to others? And we ought to be looking and asking God, for ways that we can be useful and kind to others. The third one, look at this. Do you resent that they are getting more from other church members than you get from them as a church member? All right, think about that. Do you resent the fact that they are better off for being part of the church because you're part of the church than you are better off because they're part of the church? So what do they do for the church? How do they benefit you and the church? It's kind of this thinking. And isn't that oftentimes how we approach the church? What are others doing for me? How do they make my life better? Or we look at it and say, you know what? They ought to be so glad that they're in this church because they have me in this church. Is that how we approach them? Is that truly what love is? Does Christ ever say, hey, you ought to just be glad that I had any inclination towards you and I came here and endured all this stuff for you? That's never what he does. But he's always thinking and seeking. He says, I've come to seek and to save the lost. How about this? Do you resent other people and their ministries that they have, the opportunities that they have, the gifts, the spiritual gifts that they actually have, the friendships that they have? Do you resent them and are you jealous of this fact that you don't get the same recognition that they get? You don't have the same position, the same impact, the same influence the same popularity, acceptance, and you could keep adding to that love, you know, uh, to that list. Do you know that love rejoices with those who rejoice? Do you find that difficult? And why do you find that difficult? When you find out that someone gets a new car, and this is an example I've used in the past, but it's worth looking at. When they get a new car, do you find that you're rejoicing with them? Like, oh, that is so great that you got a new car. And you're like, oh, well, it must be nice to have a new car. Yeah. I'm driving the same old beater that I've had for, you know, 15 years. And it was 15 years old when I got it. 
And rather than saying, wow, God is amazing because he made this car and it's actually a Ford and it's running for 30 years and it's still running. God is miraculous. Truly, he would be in that. But we have this idea that, you know, we don't rejoice with people when they're rejoicing. Or you find out they got a promotion or they get a raise or they get a huge bonus. Do you rejoice with them or do you just kind of feel bad for yourself? Must be nice. I can't wait till I get mine. When is it going to be my opportunity? When will it be my turn? And so you don't actually rejoice with them, but you actually find out that later on in the week that they got into a fender bender, you're kind of like, yes, there's their new car. And we're like, well, would anybody actually respond that way? And the answer is yes. I've seen it, I've watched it, and I've actually done it. Because we don't rejoice with people when they rejoice. We almost flip it around, and rather than rejoicing when they rejoice, we rejoice when they weep, and we weep when they rejoice. But that's not what love actually is. Love is not jealous. That's the word you can put in that blank there. Love is not jealous. Is your love a jealous love? Then it's really not godly love. Can you imagine God being jealous of us and what we have? And you look at that and say, well, no, he's God. But notice what God promises to us. He says that he will always give us exactly what we need when we need it. He never withholds. Think about this, when we are jealous, it's actually not a jealousy towards that other person, it's actually anger towards God, because God is withheld from us, and it's a distrust in him. Number four, do you ever view yourself as a better church member, a better spouse, a better parent, a better child than others in that same position? Do you believe that the church benefits more from your membership than it does from anybody else in the church? I remember a guy saying to our church in Michigan, saying, look, when I leave this church, and I'm going to leave this church, when I leave this church, this church is going to fall apart. And we were like, okay, bye. He left, and the church grew. What a great thing. But in his mind, he believed that he was so profitable, so beneficial to the whole church. And you know what? The funny thing is, there were so many people in the church who didn't even know who he was. And when he left, they didn't even know he left because they didn't know him. But in his mind, everyone knew him. And everyone appreciated him or didn't appreciate them the way that they should. And so he left. Do you make mental notes or verbally identify all that you do for others. I, I find myself sometimes doing that, making sure I tell other people everything that I've done, sometimes to justify what I do, sometimes to make sure people know that I'm actually busy and I'm not you know, just doing nothing. But mostly down underneath, it's because I'm prideful of that. I want people to know all that I've done. And we make these mental notes and we kind of make these lists and we remember everything that we've done for the last 50 years that we've been here. Do you see yourself as being self-important for that the church would not be able to survive without you? Do you compare yourself with others and look down on others or hold others up on pedestals? We recognize this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Remember when we went back to this, that love is humble. Humility is the primary characteristic of love and in the church and what we need in our lives. And humility opens the door for the depths of love to be given and received. Have you ever found it difficult to love a prideful person? Isn't it hard? And as a prideful person, don't you find it hard to love others? It's really hard. In fact, if you are struggling, if you're like, wow, I really have a hard time loving that person, then you ought to check back and where are you in pride and humility? Because humility lends itself towards love of others. Pride lends itself towards withholding that love. And so what we find here in this statement is love does not brag and love is not arrogant. Love does not brag, and love is not arrogant. Number five, how do you speak to others? Do you use sarcasm? I came across, I was uh, Bryn Brown, I was reading a book on leadership by her this summer, and she described sarcasm as this, tearing the flesh, tearing the flesh. And you think about this, we are one body, and it's tearing our own flesh. It's self-destructive. When we use sarcasm towards others, it is destructive to us as a body. It is not love. Very important for us to understand that. Someone comes in and they show up a few minutes late and you're like, wow, nice to have you here on time. Okay, was that loving? Well, I said it was great to see him. No, that's not what you said. You actually just tore the body. You shredded the body by doing that. And so we recognize that this is not how we ought to be interacting with it. Are you, are you cynical? Are you pessimistic? Do you disguise the truth in hurtful and harmful ways? Well, I'm speaking the truth. But remember, it's speaking the truth in love is what we're looking at there. 
Are you self-focused and full of self-pity? Because we can extend this not only in attacks towards others, but even drawing it in towards ourselves. And we're full of self-pity and complaints about the hardships that we have to endure. We're self-effacing. And like, you know, if I were to get up and sing a solo, I'm like, wow, it's a terrible solo. And, but really what I'm looking for is like people say, no, no, that was really good. Well, it's all about me at that point. It's all about drawing attention to myself. Are you self-effacing to attract compliments? Are you mean, short-tempered, caustic, intolerant, demeaning towards others? Would you say those things if Christ were with you? I, I, I was reading this past week about the disciples just before the crucifixion, and they were in this discussion, this argument, and Jesus walked up and said, hey, what are you guys talking about? And immediately, silence. They didn't want him to know that they're actually talking about their own selves. And if Christ were sitting with you, which he is, and he's hearing you, would you say those same things? So we understand this, that love is not rude. It is not unbecoming. Love speaks truth with grace. Remember, we've say, said this statement, it is speaking the words of God with the heart of God. This is what the idea of speaking truth with grace is. Think of Jesus with the woman at the well. Did he use sarcasm with her? Oh, I see you're out here alone in the middle of the day. I wonder why that is. No, that's not what he did at all. Oh, you worship in that place. He was not mean. He was not unkind. He was not intolerant. And it opened up the door for a great revival in her life, in her families, and those in the area. So love is not rude. It is not unbecoming. Number six, do you view others in the church as a means to have your own needs met? This is what we talk about sometimes, the consumer mindset with the church. Do you come here to Calvary because it meets your needs? Wrong reason. Don't come here for that. It's not what church is about. Now, will you be ministered to? Absolutely. But that's not the primary drive. It is to come to minister, to serve others. Do you view others in the church as a means to have your own needs met first and foremost? Do you seek to only take from others what you can get or choose to only give where you're going to benefit from that in some way, in some format? Do you consider the impact of your decisions on others? That is even your choices of sin and ignoring your God-given responsibilities and how that actually impacts the church. We need to get away from this individual mindset that says, oh, my sin is my sin and it only impacts me. No, and the body of Christ, it actually infect, infects and affects the entire church. We are all affected by this. So do you comp- consider the impact of your decisions on others in the church or do you only consider what is good for you? Love intentionally seeks to serve the good of other people. And that is the first and foremost focus of it. So we could say it this way. Love does not seek her own. It is not selfish. Love does not seek her own. It is not selfish. It is not self-centered. It's kind of like the illustration we've used in the past when we throw up a picture. If we were to put up a picture of everybody here today on the screen, who would you look for first? And how do you determine if it's a good picture or not? Yeah, all other... 69 people look terrible, but I look good, so it's a good picture. Isn't that how we often approach it? And we often approach church that way too. Hey, it benefits me, so therefore it's good. But we ought to be looking to say, how does it benefit others? This is what Christ-like love is like. Number seven, how quickly do we respond in anger or with irritation? Are we easily bothered? Are you under control and calm, or are you out of control? And this is not just here at church. You are the church wherever you go. So as the church, as we go, are we calm? Are we under control? Do you seek to be under, an understanding person? That is, understanding of the difficulties that other people face. Do you know that's an amazing thing? We have no idea what people face. You go to that person who walks in and you respond like, oh, it's so nice that you made it here on time, using sarcasm. But what you don't recognize is that what just happened in their life, maybe they had some devastating news. Maybe they got a call from one of their kids. Maybe they had difficulty with their kids just getting out of the house this morning. It's kind of fun talking with our daughter because that's what Sunday morning is like for them. It's usually Sunday morning when Eve decides to blow through all of her clothes just as you're ready to walk out the door. That happened to us so many times. I'm thankful those are in the past and that we don't have to deal with that anymore. But, uh, you know, we have no idea what they just came from. And we ought to be seeking to be understanding, like, oh, it is so good to have you here. Wouldn't you be rather welcome that way? 
even if nothing happened before he walked in the doors, that people are just like, it is so good to see you. We are so glad you're here. And like, wow, it is good to be here. Or, wow, nice to be on time. Oh, uh, that's not friendly at all. It's kind of like, okay, I'll go home. How are we showing this love? So we understand this. We do not jump to conclusions. We do not speak before hearing the whole matter. In fact, Proverbs, if you've been reading through Proverbs this year, you would have come across that verse a number of times that basically if you speak for it before hearing the whole story, you're a fool. Don't be a fool, but rather let us be loving and understanding and recognize that there is much more to what's going on. Love is not easily provoked. It is not irritable is what we would put in the statement there. Love is not easily provoked. It is not irritable. Too often, you know, we excuse our irritation by stress, lack of food, lack of sleep, whatever it is. But do you understand that in Christ-like love, agape love, there is no room for any of that. There's no tolerance. You never saw Jesus. Remember, he's, at the, he's meeting with the woman at the well, and if it were you and I, we would be hangry. Remember what the disciples are doing? They're going to look for food. But Jesus wasn't short-tempered. He wasn't irritable. He wasn't, you know, trite with this woman. He was loving, gracious, and kind, even though he was physically hungry. Because he recognized that the greatest calling was actually to demonstrate love toward this woman, God's love toward this woman, so that she could turn to Christ. So love is not easily provoked, it is not irritable. Number eight, do you tend to give grace or judgment? What's your characteristic? How do you interact with people? Do people walk away from you feeling judged or feeling encouraged because of the grace they experienced at your hand? Do you build up others with encouragement? Or you weigh them down with disappointments and condemnation. And we can do that with our words. We can do that with our looks. Isn't that true? You know when people are happy with you, and you know when people are disappointed with you. And that can be discouraging or it can be encouraging. Do you remind others how they fail to meet your expectations? Are others more aware of what you don't like about them or what you appreciate and value about them? One of the things that we did with the the teachers for a while on their birthdays, we would have, I would call them eulogies, right? Because when do we typically have eulogies? We say all these great things about people once they, they die. What good is that to them? We need to hear it now, and people need to hear what you appreciate. And it, it'd be a great practice just as you come to church to say, you know what, I'm going to look to say something that I appreciate about everybody that I have a conversation with. And so I'm going to come up, and I'm going to see Alex at the door. Alex, I appreciate you, and I'm thankful that you're standing here at the door every week to greet me. It could be something. You know what? Alex is not going to be like, that's stupid. Why'd they say that? No, he's going to be like, oh, that, that's good. And he's going to be like, I'm going to be there because people appreciate me, and they value what's going on, and it's an encouragement. And so many times we just kind of take it for granted, and we don't say anything. We seek to help others of their value, of their worth, in the eyes, not just of us, but actually of God himself and how we can encourage them in that way. So love does not keep an account of wrongs. It does not think evil. It does not keep an account of wrong. It's not, I don't look at people and see the list of everything that you failed at, but really looking at people and saying all the potential. Look at what God could do. Look at how God could work in the midst of this person and using them in this powerful way. Do you seek truth? This is number nine. Do you seek truth rather than vindication? Do you rejoice more in protecting others or more in gossiping about others? Do you speak truth or manipulate situations for your desired response, for your desired outcome? Do you rejoice at other sins and failures or do you seek restoration and reconciliation? What do you look for in others? Do you look for their failures or their successes? Do you look to condemn or commend? I remember preaching actually right here in this auditorium Oh, I was somewhere between the age of 14 and 16. And I was preaching for one of my very first times ever in a live congregation. I had done it for competition before that. But it was one of my first times ever preaching live. And I actually remember I preached out of Psalm 1. And I remember preaching. And I remember someone telling me, he said, you know what? The great thing is, at your age, it doesn't matter how bad your message is, people are going to encourage you. And that actually helped. And I, I thought about that. And I thought... It could be the worst thing ever, and it was the worst one ever. Well, I have one other one that I preached many years ago that was really, really bad. It was worse than that first one, but I was looking at that and thinking about that, and that was so encouraging because it was true. 
I finished the message and, you know, greeting people and everybody's like, that was great. That was so great. They're all encouraging. But you know what? Why doesn't that happen when I'm 51? Why aren't people as encouraged? And, and I'm joking in one sense because you are very encouraging people uh, in the preaching. But, you know, why is it that at 16, we're all full of encouragement, but with adults, we're like, you know, just shake our head. And that communicates a lot. We ought not to be rejoicing in evil, but we ought to be rejoicing in truth. And we ought to be celebrating the truth. We ought to be celebrating what God is doing and rejoicing what is going on rather than just, you know, pointing out all the faults. You know, you preach, you preach for 35 minutes or 40 minutes and, and someone says, yeah, you know, 39 minutes and 30 seconds was pretty good, but there was 30 seconds that I counted that was not good. And so basically the whole message is worthless. Oh, really? <laughs> and, and why do we measure people's lives like that? Like, yeah, your whole life is pretty good, but you messed up that one time, so basically I'm checking you off my list. You don't measure up because we rejoice in the evil. We focus on the evil rather than rejoicing in the truth and what is good and what God is doing. Number 10, have you ever said, I can't deal with you anymore? Have you ever had that comment? Have you ever had that thought? Have you ever verbalized that to someone? I can't take this anymore. Think about what you're actually saying. You've put a limit on God. You've put a limit on your dependence on God. And you're basically saying that God's love is not sufficient in this injury. It is more of an attack on God than it is a revelation of your own self, although it does reveal your own faithlessness. How do you handle other people's failings and idiosyncrasies? Do you seek to bear others or do you seek to bolt? Do you seek to go along with them in walking in the journey that they're in? We could ask it this way. What are your limits that you put on people? How far will you go? Isn't this exactly what Peter was saying? He's like, oh, I've got a marker that's way out there, seven times. And Jesus, you can almost imagine him kind of chuckling like, oh, yeah, that's pretty good, Peter, but let me tell you exactly what the gospel does. The gospel goes way beyond what you can even imagine. And I imagine that Peter just shaking his head like, how in the world could I ever get to 70 times 7? Well, only by God's grace. We're willing to bear through even suffering. And again, here, we're not talking about sinful situations um, that are harmful and detrimental. That's not what we're talking about. But we're saying, hey, people treat me unkindly. Can you bear with it? Or do you just write them off? You know, oftentimes that people become the most unkind at the moment that God is doing the greatest work in their heart because they are fighting and they're in complete battle. And so they're striking out at everything. But it's just at that moment where God is about ready to break through and bring change and transformation in their life. Will we be willing to suffer? You know, that's exactly what Christ did. He came and he was wrongly accused and he suffered for things that he did not do, yet he was faithful. And this is what you and I are actually called to do as well. So we see this, that love bears all things, number 10. Love bears all things. Are you bearing all things? Or are you bailing on the situation? Giving up, writing that person off. Number 11, have you stopped believing in God's power to change? Do you believe that God can change everyone? That he can transform anyone? Do you really? Even that person that we mentioned at the very beginning, do you believe God can change them? Do you believe that God can change you and your relationship with them? So we recognize God does have this power to change. This is what the gospel is all about. Do you conclude with these people, you know, that's just the way they are, that's the way they've always been. Or do you say, God, you know what, use me to bring about growth in their life? Because that's what we'll look at in the weeks to come, is growing up in Christ. This is what we're called to do. Have you given up hope? and the work of transformation of God's Spirit in the life of His people? Do you pray for God to be fully revealed in others? And in doing so, God, reveal yourself fully through me as well. See, what we understand here is that love believes and hopes all things. You know, too often we are involved in rehearsing the failures of others in our mind with them and reminding them of what they've done, as well as others and reminding them what this person has done? Or do you seek restoration and reconciliation? Does your forgiveness have limits? Might be a way we could ask this. You have a line that you've drawn that says they've gone too far. Or do you believe that God can continue to change? That God can bring about true transformation? So it hopes all things. Love hopes all things. Number 12, 
Do you remain steadfast even through suffering of wrongs from those that are around you? Loving and seeking to minister with an end to edify and to build up. What does it take to cause you to give up? What if you quit already because of the way people treated you, because of your faithless love for those people and faithless dependence upon God? What does it take to cause you to change course, to avoid people? Are there people that you've given up on because you don't like how they make you suffer or how they make you feel uncomfortable or how they wrongly judge you? And so now you just avoid them. Do you know there's never a passage of Scripture that says, hey, if someone irritates you, just avoid them. Actually, we find if someone does wrong to you at the end of Romans chapter 12, we overcome evil by what? Doing good. So we do good. Even when they are evil towards us. Even when they're unkind. And this is very difficult and very challenging for us. But we understand this at number 12, that love endures all things. And isn't Christ's grace and love for us actually an incredible example of that? And it's him that indwells us, according to Galatians 2.20, his life in us. And then number 13, this is just really kind of a comment. I love how Paul ends this, that love never fails. Never fails. Never stops. Never ends. We will be loved for all of eternity. You know, the other things that he talks about there, the idea of faith, do you know that we won't live by faith in eternity because God is present with us? We'll be seen. And we see here, though, that love will be experienced all through eternity. It will never end. So here are a couple of things for us to consider. How are you doing speaking the truth in love? Do you exhibit this Christ-like love towards others, biblical, godly, Christ-like love? If it seems impossible, then you're right, because we need Christ doing this through us. But more importantly, how is God working through you? We ask the questions, what have you learned today? But so what? In other words, how are you going to be changed? How is God working in your life to alter you as far as your love for others in the body of Christ? Does Christ have freedom to work through you and to love through you as well? God, I thank you so much for your word and the truth of your word. And I pray that our hearts would be transformed and altered as a result of being in the word of God as well. May we take this phrase, speaking the truth in love, and apply it to our lives and grow in our faith and dependence upon you so that Christ might, through us, edify and minister to those in the body of Christ so that we may, as we'll see next week, grow in Christ. We again thank you for the truth of your word and the conviction of it, but also the forgiveness that has already been provided, the restoration and reconciliation and empowerment that you give to us as well. We give you thanks and praise. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.